We're the Heat Activated Wearable Technology Group, and I'm Brian. My name is Sunny. I'm Marsha. I'm Brian. And Mike. What our project is is that we're trying to power a medical device using our body heat. So I want everyone to take a moment and notice the temperature of this room. Is it, is it hot to you? Is it cold to you? Or do you feel nothing at all? The thing is that all around us, there's the sun, air conditioning, heater, but there's a, there's a certain warmness and coolness on our skin. We saw this as an opportunity for us. We wanted to use the temperature of the environment, the temperature of our skin, as an opportunity, as an energy source for a medical device. So let me ask you, well, let me ask everyone a question. Who here does not carry a portable device around with them on a daily basis? So most of you do carry like a cell phone, an MP3, or some kind of gaming device. Yeah. <laughs> some kind of gaming device. <clears throat> but, and that's how the market has shifted within the past decade or so. And so has the medical device industry. Nowadays we have non-invasive glucose monitoring systems, portable defibrillators, portable heart pumps, and personal portable pulse oximeters. All of these devices require continuous power. And with this continuous power, it, like the purpose of medical monitoring, I mean for portable devices for medical monitoring, and they require two things, disposable batteries and manual recharging. The problem is right now is that disposable batteries is that there's, we have to look at the sustainable issues of, of our environment. And also, let me give you an example. If there was, like let's say you're doing an ECG scan at night and the battery ran out, there's gonna be a discrepancy within time and the doctor wouldn't be able to see all the data required for this person. So what our motivation was to create a sustainable energy source that was power efficient for a medical device. So our general, our general overall de development is that we want to use our body heat to power a medical device and eventually transmit this commute and transmit the data to a, a mobile device. We will be going about this using thermoelectric generators, which will harvest energy from the, from the body, and we will be powering a medical device. Now, thermoelectric generators as a technology does not provide as much power as plugging something into your wall outlet. So we're going to be powering a low energy Device. To do this, we're going to be utilizing a power management system, also a power processor. And this will be doing MPPT and other various things that we will explain to you. Controlling our medical device will be a microcontroller, and the microcontroller will be letting the device know when to turn on, and it will be getting the data from the medical device. It will then forward it to an RF transceiver, which will then display it on an iPhone application. The first part that we will be explaining to you is the thermoelectric generator. So the thermoelectric generator is the mode of energy harvest that we use for this project. Um, first, um, a thermoelectric generator is a flat shaped uh, module with a voltage that's generated when there's a temperature difference between the two plates. And um, it does not require light or motion um, compared to piezoelectric generators or solar cells. And so this is a a different approach of energy har 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 harvesting. So alpha um, is a CBAT coefficient, and this is specific to each thermoelectric generator. And so for our case, our alpha was 0 0.1 volts per degree Celsius. And so this means that at a temperature difference of 15 degrees Celsius, there is a 1.5 volt max per TEG that can be generated. And so this is enough voltage to power many low power systems. And so we want to maximize this voltage by using things to dissipate the heat greatly. So if we are able to um, dissipate all that energy, then technically we can get uh, 1.5 voltage per TEG. So the body as a source of energy is actually um, very excellent because it provides more than 100 watts of heat if we can harness all that body heat. And um, this is enough to power um, the, at least three laptops. So there's a two to 17 degrees Celsius temperature difference between the surface of a body and average room temperature. And so um, parts such as the neck has a 72 degree Celsius difference because there's very little thermal resistance there and lots of blood flow per area. Whereas other places like the wrist has a six degree Celsius difference because of the blood flow there. And so furthermore, TEGs are safe to be used on the body because the ceramic plates which are in contact with the skin are rather inert and do not cause um, adverse side side effects when in contact with the skin for a very long time. So in designing a prototype, um, first we want to maintain the temperature difference um, 
Secondly, we want to choose an ideal location of the body that will sustain this temperature difference. And we want to maintain the contact between the body and the thermoelectric generators. So the first prototype that we worked on is a wrist one. And here we use a smaller size um, TEGs and we connected them in series. And um, we were able to generate some power, but not enough. So we enhanced this by attaching the heat sinks on top of it. But even then, we needed um, at least eight of those smaller ones in order to have enough power for the rest of our system. And so to improve on this design, we thought of another idea, and that's the hydration pack model. And so here, it's a backpack. And sewn on the backpack, we have um, TEGs on, this, on the back side of the back padding. And um, actually, inside of the backpack, there's a pocket which can house a water bladder. And we take advantage of the temperature gradient that exists between the hot back and the cooler water bladder. And this drives the, um, the sustains the voltage for a longer period of time. So after harnessing all that heat energy and converting it to electricity, we want to um, manage that power and use it most efficiently. So that's where power management comes in. In order to design the most um, efficient power management system possible, we have to take a few key points into consideration. The first was managing the input from the TEGs. Through our testing, we determined that each TEG module outputs at maximum a 20 millivolts. Um, our overall device needs at least three volts to run. So in order to reach this goal of three volts, we used a boost converter. The second thing was because there is a low amount of power harness from the TEGs, we had to find a way to maximize that. We did this through a process called MPPT, or Maximum Power Point um, The third thing was once we gathered or harnessed all of this energy, how would we store it and make it useful for our system? So we decided to implement the use of rechargeable batteries so that we can make sure that we have enough energy stored in our system to power it at any given time. All of those considerations were found in the form of energy processors. So for our project, we researched several different types of processors. The two main ones that we tested and looked into were um, one from Simbet and one from Texas Instruments. Um, when we were looking at them, we looked at a cube a few key specifications. Um, first was the cold start voltage, which is the initial voltage needed to turn on the system. Second was the Quiescin current, which is the current that is constantly flowing through the system even when it's not active. Um, next we looked to see if there was a boost converter already incorporated in the processor and whether or not it was programmed for MPPT. <laughs> Um, we looked at its energy storage compatibility with different types of batteries and capacitors. And we also looked at the overall chip size because we were making a very portable device. We wanted something very small. Uh, from this chart, uh, you can see that the TI energy processor met all the specific specifications that we were looking at. So as Lauren has mentioned, that MPPT is essential for energy harvesting. So thermoelectric generators are not regular power supplies. As the, load, as the load resistance increases, the output voltage also increases. As the load resistance increases, I mean decreases, the output voltage also follows suit. There is no inherent voltage regulation when we connect a thermoelectric generator directly to the load. And, or, and in order to maximize the power transfer, we must equal equate the load resistance with the internal resistance. This is done by operating, by varying the operating point of the modules in order to deliver maximum available transfer. So this is the graph of an, um, a typical, typical power curve of a thermoelectric generator. As you can see, in order to gain maximum power point transfer, we must have an operating point of at least 50% of the voltage regular of the open circuit voltage for our circuit in order to deliver as much power as possible from our thermoelectric generators. So this is a simplified version of our application circuit. The ones highlighted are the resistors programmed for our maximum power point tracking. Next two are for our battery protection and for our load. 
And finally, um, this is where we added our, load, our system load and our batteries. So this is our simulation results. Um, for our input voltage of our, of our simulations, we put 500 millivolts in the first graph. In the second graph, you can see that maximum power point transfer is working because we have 250 millivolts, which is um, half of our 500 millivolts. Our third graph shows our boost converter working. We see that as programmed, we have three volts that we can we are able to get from our 500 input 500 millivolts input voltage, and we can store that into our battery, which is a little less than three volts. So after we've harvested all of the energy that we want to enter into the system load section, so the system load section we have to consist of a microcontroller, a low power medical device that we chose to be a pulse sensor, and also an RF transceiver that communicates with an iPhone application. Originally in our scope of our project, we chose to use a pulse oximeter, but we, do, we use the pulse sensor as a device. The reason being was because physically these are very similar devices. They both use infrared photo uh, light emitting diodes. So the only difference is, is that there's a computational process difference that's done elsewhere, either on the phone or the computer. So by proving that a pulse sensor can be used within our system, then we can prove that it can be used as a pulse oximeter as well. The particular pulse sensor that we are using for our system is the one displayed below. The, it is the one with the heart on it. It, is, it uses a 3 volt logic and runs on 4.5 micro milliamps. I'm sorry. Um, it is controlled by a microcontroller, which in our case we're using the MSP430. Um, initially, it was designed to be used with the Arduino microcontroller but we were not able to use this microcontroller due to its power requirements of five volts and 50 milliamps per IO pin. The way that this pulse sensor connects with our MSP430 microcontroller is through serial communication, and, our, and the reason we chose the MSP430 microcontroller was due to its low power requirements of only 270 microamps and 2.2 volts. This MSP430 is displayed below on the uh, picture, and on board the same chip is an RF antenna. We decided to use this chip in particular because this RF antenna was 1.8 volts running at a maximum of 35 microamps. This combined microcontroller and RF system uh, would still be consuming less than the Arduino microcontroller, which was the biggest competitor. So when deciding how to get information to the iPhone application, there were three main things that came into mind. First of all was basic Bluetooth. We, we wanted to do this because basic Bluetooth is in all, most phones and mobile devices. However, the power requirements that basic Bluetooth needs far exceed our uh, power output. Then the next thing we want to look at, which was uh, released early on in the project, was Bluetooth 4.0. Bluetooth 4.0 released a new standard called Bluetooth Low Energy, which would have fallen into our power requirement needs. However, there was low support and availability as far as devices that would have the Bluetooth 4.0 chips. So we had to resort to using, so we had to use a direct interface, which using the Red Park breakout cable, which provides us with a serial interface to connect to an iPhone, we would be connecting another microcontroller and RF transceiver so we have two microcontroller and RF transceivers on either end of our system, wirelessly connected to each other, and that would be sending its data through the Red Park breakout cable, and that would therefore meet the Apple's MFI requirements, saying that our system is an approved device. The application that we have is very simple. It just has what it is, the, the value of the information we're getting, and a button that will get the most recent reading from the sensor. We are having a data logging feature so that if someone were to want to get their full information, they can connect to a computer and get a text file of all the recordings and at what time that happened. And since this is a very flexible interface, 
we want to eventually branch out into the updates of this form to have a patient and doctor relationship. So as when the, when the person's being measured at home, the doctor can receive the information elsewhere and can monitor the health of the individual. Also, since it, since it is flexible, and we can also apply this to different kinds of applications of different kinds of sensors, not just pulse oximeters or pulses. Now that we've explained to you the entire circuit that we've designed, um, here's an overall chart showing the power consumption of everything, including power management, microcontrollers, our RF transceivers, and a pulse sensor. So you can see that the total power consumed is around 14 milliwatts. Majority of that comes from the actual sens medical sensor that we use, which consumes 13.5 milliwatts. Um, this, the system that we designed takes up only about 3% of the total power needed, so we have met our low, ultra low power energy requirement. Um, you can also see right here that our power output per TEG is only about 17 microwatts, which if you compare it to the total power, we will not be able to power it constantly. So we've designed our system in a way that it will run at intervals, allowing our TEGs to power the batteries um, and once we gather enough power from the battery, we will use it until it discharges and then So here is a video of our actual prototype. So this is the uh, energy processing chip. It is connected to a rechargeable battery. And it is also, there is the microcontroller in RF, and that is the pulse sensor being lit up. This uh, pulse sensor right here is being measured within our water hydration pack, and the device is in closed within the backpack and it's being harvested. This is another example of our demonstration of where the system is outside of the backpack. So you can see where the system is and see how it connects uh, with the rechargeable battery, the energy harvester, and the RF, and how it's connected to the individual and measuring his pulse. From this pulse, we want this information to be transmitted to an iPhone application where it is then received by for further away and you can see that the pulse is then measured. So we, we, in the very, like nine months ago, we had a very ambitious goal. We had a lot of goals in mind for our project. First, we wanted to prove that thermoelectric generators can be proved to be used as a reliable energy source for a medical device. We did that. Second, we wanted to design our own power management system that's efficient for thermoelectric generators and health devices. And we also designed that, and we have the PCB design, and we did do that as well. Lastly, we wanted to have this information and transmitted towards an iPhone application and have a very user-friendly application, and we did that as well. So lastly, we finally created this foundation that we've created, and we want to branch out further. So as part of future developments, we want to power other kinds of devices, such as non-invasive glucose monitoring systems. We want to power other kinds of devices, like heart pumps or anything else. Lastly, we want to, continuous, we want to create a continuous sustainable medical monitoring system that can be used throughout the entire day. We also see other future developments in other developing nations, such as, because when the other, they don't have clinics that don't have like these sort of systems all, all the time, so they need these portable devices so others can share the devices and then create a sustainable environment for these individuals. And we honestly couldn't have done this project without the, our advisors, Dr. Shobha Krishnan, uh, Dr. Hoi Young Lee and also Dr. Ahmad Amir. We want to thank our model, uh, Gupal Singh, who helped us with our demonstration. Uh, the, the collaborators that helped us, our graduate student, mechanical engineer, Miguel Gomez, and uh, people that helped us with the PCB design from Spark, Sparktron, Elena Shi, Amy Lim, and Dr. Jack Ho. We also want to thank uh, the Texas Instruments and Linear Technology for supplying uh, devices for us to help us with our project. And last but not least, the School of Engineering of Santa Clara that helped us fund this entire project and allowed us to finish and design our entire medical device. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> sure. I was just wondering, uh, on implants in uh, you know, like heart devices, or does that device, what you're creating here, does that actually have to become a part of that internal device, or is it something that can be applied from the outside. We actually looked at that, and uh, like for example, pacemakers, and they actually take a lot more power. And so, for our purposes, like they actually don't generate enough power to power those kinds of devices. 
What's the type of your difference between like the wrist application and like the back application and then what's like clothing? Yeah, there is a lot more thermal resistance on the back because there's more muscle on your back and you have a lot of clothing. But we um, we traded that off between um, the larger surface area on the back. And so even though the wrist has a, a higher temperature gradient, we chose the back for the larger surface area. So some of your specs you showed one TEG, but in one of the things you had like an array. So which so those specs there, have you, did you look at like if you can make a large enough array or how what the surface area would be to actually not have to use any of the other version that you did? So if you if we were if we wanted to have our system powered constantly, it would take a very large array. We, however, have an array of about six TEGs and we can run our system for about a minute every five minutes. So we have so we have a harvest energy harvesting phase in which the battery charges, and then we have the depletion uh, time in which we get data. Do you have to make any considerations for, let's say, that uh, body temperature fluctuations during the day, like if they're asleep versus they're, if they're awake? Is that a concern? Rel relatively, um, the body remains at a constant temperature because we have to maintain like a, um, a homeostasis state for the body. So it, it, I guess it depends on the more and so the environment, and there is a fluctuation and change. But overall, what we measured, or what Marsha helped uh, uh, did as well, was the average between the entire day, which was about 15 degrees Celsius. So at that, at that, around that average, then we were able to say the average voltage per day. This is how much we can produce within, with our system. What would be the next phase of the project in terms of cost? This is measurement. What do you guys see? So, well, well, the next phase of our thing is we want to we want to do it into other kinds of medical devices, such as non-invasive glucose monitoring systems. <coughs> but, 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 but I like your questions about cost, Rel like cost relative to how much the batteries are consumed to dispose of batteries. Eventually. A thermal electric generator is a more sustainable solution in the long run for like marketing or in profit, because the over years after years like the cost of batteries will accumulate. Did you experiment with you know you went to the backpack model? Did you experiment with other series connections like if there's a wrap on the thigh or a wrap on the back like you see like a you know like a heat injury you know you put like a heat pack or cold pack kind of thing wrapping other parts of the body, but. Um, we, we, there's actually like a paper that I found that looked at different parts of the body and where there's more heat emitted. And so actually the legs actually, there's not that much heat emitted, even though you would think because there's a lot of muscle there and you're like activating that muscle, then there's a lot of heat release. But no, because of the, there, because of the muscle there, it actually um, creates resistance and there is less heat loss there. And so, um, so we settled on the backpack model because it seemed like convenient to use the hydration pack as well to that and you said electric cells rigid, like did you actually wrap them? Or, or oh, are you stuck with They're like, solid, yeah. So, so is solid. there a way to make them flexible so you could actually have no, to stick to No, they're not screen? flexible. Um, one, way, one way possibly to create a flexibility that you want would be sort of to create the chainmail effect of having very small solid objects so that, but they're all connected together so that you can have the curvature maybe if you would like. So that's kind of what we did with the wristband. We used a smaller size of so the two screws. Okay, so when you guys were looking into this, so was there any, did you find anything about the effect on the energy level of people? Like if you had this on all day, you know, would that, I know people who wear, you know, have their eyes are out of focus or whatnot, they use energy, their eyes use energy focusing or whatnot. So people experience say that they're tired from that, you know. Did, did you guys find anything like that? Like if you were to sit there with this thing on all day, would you feel any effects from that? Okay, so I guess I did the tests with the TEGs and yeah, so I did experience like a, a type of like coldness um, after a while, um, but I mean if you move around and you stimulate that part of your body again, then like um, that, that gain like resumes. Yeah, you don't feel tired because you're losing energy. It's, you're, not, you're not losing energy with that thing, we're just using the energy you're already going to be losing. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Yeah, we're not su we're not sucking energy out of you. What are you with that? Have you thought about an application of using this powered hearing aids? Digital hearing aids still have a, a bad resource, and uh, knowing folks that use them, it's very difficult when that battery wears out, or if the rechargeable batteries it still wears out. I think that's part of the future applications that we saw this going in the direction of because we didn't look at every single kind of medical device that we can look at. But that's definitely an application that we would look at because, like you said, when it does run out, what does this person do with it? And this would be able to help this person sustain a longer period of time with that battery. So this is definitely an application that we would definitely look at in the future. So initially, in our initial research, yeah, I did look at cochlear implants because um, they have to be surgery, they have to do surgery to like replace that battery. And so, but then um, the power requirement for those implants is actually quite high. So I, I, I don't believe the digital hearing aids have a very high power requirement. And being able to augment that could perhaps, and I don't know what, but obviously you need other interfaces, but to augment that could ex extend the life of that battery maybe from eight hours until 12 hours. Is that possible? Perhaps that application would be more feasible if the in the future when the gener when the manufacturers of thermal electric generators get them to a size small enough such that you wouldn't have an encumbrance on the person's ear. If we could get it down so that the structure of the the uh, the hearing aid is made out of thermal electric generators, that would be a great way to use it rather than having them have some or some sort of uh, attachment to power it on their wrist or on their back. Yeah. yeah. So um, the backpack idea looks really like, big. It's a big design. Um, you have to wear it and it's obviously seen by everyone. Um, and many people like to have wearable technology which is scaled down, um, something that's not too obtrusive. Now that would probably reduce the effectiveness of the TEG. So if we were, if one of the demands of the market is to scale it down to something that would not be too obvious in public, what would be the uh, steps to achieve that? So one, we looked at um, heat pipes as well as a solution in addition to heat sinks because heat sinks are solid, and although they provide that surface area, they're rather bulky, and so we don't want to use that. That's like impractical to wear. So we also. Um, talked about using heat pipes to develop it into some type of wearable sleeve to dissipate that heat on the TEGs when we make a wristband model. As far as the system goes though, uh, I'm sure in coming years there will be there will be smaller devices that we can use, smaller batteries with the same amount of output, smaller TEGs themselves, so we might have even less TEG on the backpack, and so it might end up just becoming a normal backpack a normal hydration backpack. And also creating a more efficient power management systems. And the chips, like, we looked at Simbet originally and then we looked at TI. The power management systems for these ultra low power solutions, they're evolving very, very fast. Originally, when we looked at nine months ago, they didn't have this TI product. And we looked at the Simbet chip and it, it wasn't that great for us because the power management was way too high. But then three months later, they said, hey, this TI, this is for ultra low power for thermal electric modules. So it is evolving. So then eventually we can reach to the handheld level and more uh, discreetly. Cool. Okay. Any more questions? Thank you, guys.